thanks so much everyone for joining us here today. Um, it's so great to see all of you joining in right now. And uh, especially thanks for so many of you that also started with sending us questions in advance. It was really good to hear what you're wondering about. And uh, we did our best to add your questions into our presentation as we go along. And of course, we'll still have time to answer them at the end of the presentation. So throughout this presentation, you'll see that there's a Q&A panel. Please do add your questions in there. It helps us keep track of which ones we have answered and, and haven't. And of course, if you have any comments, you can also leave those in the chat. But we'll be focusing on the Q&A panel for the questions. So today we have here joining us uh, Maya Johannesson, who is a senior manager uh, here at Nordic Sustainability and a circular economy and policy specialist, bringing a background in consultancy and also um, policy at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. My name is Michelle Gordon. I'm a senior consultant at Nordic Sustainability, and I've been working with sustainable and circular product developments in manufacturing and electronics and have a background with sustainable and design engineering. So in today's, uh, today's webinar, we'll be covering a very brief introduction to Nordic Sustainability so that you know where we're coming from. Before then, Maya will dive into the policy landscape and explain how finance and reporting um, interacts in, and works with sustainable products and circular economy. Next, I'll discuss product design and development um, policies, specifically the eco design regulation will be our main focus for today before touching on communication labeling and greenwashing. So all of this we'll aim to cover in about 30 minutes to have the last 15 minutes for a Q&A. And just so you're aware, this is the first part of a three-part webinar series. We'll be following up with a webinar on achieving climate targets of circularity, as well as some practical experiences inspiration about integrating circularity and product development. So please stay tuned for those. So without further ado, uh, Maya, the screen is yours. Thank you. So just very briefly before we start, uh, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we are a Copenhagen-based consultancy uh, who is specialized in working in an intersection between strategy and sustainability, which in more practical terms means that we work with uh, usually large corporates around anything from understanding where they are by conducting baseline assessment, materiality assessments, to helping to set targets and KPIs and develop strategies. And now also working with a number of companies on actually executing those strategies. So implementing many of those uh, actions that they identify throughout the uh, um, strategy process. And uh, yeah, and when it comes to circular economy, so that is also one of the key focus areas that we have within our uh, team. Uh, we also, uh, of course, also looking into baselining in relation to circular economy. So that could also be conducting impact screening or setting specific uh, product KPIs, uh, map uh, policies relating to circular economy. So you're going to benefit a little bit from that today uh, to also yeah set more wider strategy and, and targets. Um, and then we're also working on specific implementation projects, such as developing uh, design guides together with, with clients or running uh, design sprints and workshops and, and, of course, a number of different types of capacity building activities. Now, but let's move into the EU policy landscape. Um, so when it comes to the EU, I, I always like to just take a step back to really for to truly understand where the EU is coming from. That's always helpful. Um, so with the EU, you have one key strategy uh, that kind of sets the direction for the EU going forward. So that is the uh, European Green Deal that sets out the, the economic development uh, plan for Europe. Uh, together with that, uh, the EU also has other focus areas, for example, uh, digitalization and data, and also building a more socially just economy. So whenever you read through EU European policy, you would see references back to some of these areas. Um, now breaking the European uh, Green Deal down a little bit further. Um, um, so the first of all, the Green Deal is kind of encapsulating a paradigm shift within EU economic policy. 
uh, before we often talked about that we need to grow uh, and then growth our economy and then deal with our sustainability issues on the side or afterwards. But with the Green Deal, sustainability has really uh, been integrated into the way the EU understands economic development. So the Green Deal also sets out the, the target to become a net zero uh, emission region by 2050, which entails also reducing CO2 emission by 55% by 2030. Uh, to reach that goal, uh, the EU also sets out the ambition to decouple economic growth from resource use, um, which of course is also why circular economy is one of the key pillars of the Green Deal. Um, another uh, element that we're also looking a little bit into today is the financing the transition, um, where, because this is also an area that has um, large kind of in integration of circular economy aspects. Yes. So starting with that. Uh, so again, just having the big picture here, uh, when we talk about climate, uh, we know that we need to reduce our emissions and we need to do it fast. The EU is very aware of this fact. They're also aware of that the transition is not happening fast enough. And one of the issues are that the investments into the green transition is simply not ramping up quick enough. Right now, they need to ramp up 13 times faster than they are currently. Um, that also means that uh, the reason why finance and then uh, reporting is one of the core areas that the EU is regulating on right now. So, Nick, yeah. So, um, I mean, there's so much policy coming out of the EU. This is kind of an overview of, of some of the, the policies that we'll be looking into today. Uh, I will now briefly just touch on the ESRS, so the European Sustainability Reporting Standards. Uh, and the taxonomy and explain how circular economy is integrated into those. Um, first of all, uh, when we talk about the, the new reporting standards that the EU is putting into place, so they this is under the CSRD, so the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, that's going to replace the current uh, non-financial disclosure uh, directive that we have now. Uh, and in very short, it's it's going to affect a, many more companies. Right now, it's only uh, just under 12,000 companies that have to do sustainability reporting annually. But by 2025, it will be it will be more than 55,000 companies. Uh, it will also affect small uh, small companies by 26. So any listed small company will also have to do uh, for a report on the standards that set out in the ESRS. And then finally, in 28, it's also going to be non-European companies that have to report. Yeah, yes. And like overall, like high level on, on the ESRS, it really sets out some significant changes to the way companies have to report and reflect on their sustainability impacts. So first of all, businesses have to report on impacts across their entire value chain. So that being their own operations, their supply chain, but also uh, downstream, for example, uh, in the use phase of their products uh, and, and of course the waste management phase. Uh, the EU has also introduced double materiality, so that means that companies have to report on how they impact society negatively, uh, but also and then how that might affect the company itself uh, through uh, financial risk. Uh, companies, oh, not yet. Uh, companies also have to then also have third party assurance, so they have they, this data has to be much more reliable. Uh, the the scope of what they have to report on has increased significantly, so the need for data is really, really big. And then finally, what uh, what I think, especially in this context, is really interesting is that companies would also have to uh, report on how uh, their business model and commercial strategy is linked to the uh, the sustainability impacts they have on society so meaning many companies now have set climate targets according to the SPTI uh, but they actually haven't yet necessarily um, developed an action plan that's going to ensure that they get there uh, they might even have uh, also not having have reflected on whether their commercial strategy would be a barrier for them to reach to reach that climate target uh, but under the ESRS, they would have to disclose uh, how these things are interlinked. Uh, so I think that's going to put a lot of pressure and a lot of need to look into also new circular business models. Yes. Um, now moving on to the to the uh, yeah to taxonomy. Uh, this is just so in conjunction with the ESRS, companies also have to disclose how green uh, their business activities are. Um, 
And, and this is along uh, six environmental objectives that the EU has set out. And under here, circular economy is going to be one of the key objectives that you have to report against. Uh, um, the, uh, yeah, the delegated act that says like, how you do that has not yet been adopted for the circular economy, but will come later this year. Yeah, next slide. Um, yes. And then uh, when it comes to the ESS, where, where circular economy sits, uh, it sits um, primarily under what we call the, the topical standards. So these are like areas that company, no matter the sector, have to report on. Uh, and then it also sits uh, under the ESRS2. This is where the companies have to report on how impacts are related to their business model. Uh, coming later this year, there will also be some sector specific standards. So if you are within some of the uh, sectors listed here, you would also get additional uh, reporting requirements. Yeah. Uh, but just diving a little bit more into the ESR uh, S5. So these are the, yes, the things that you would have to report on uh, uh, under that's related to the circular economy. Uh, it's quite a lot. I have I just copied some of it out here, some of what I find the most important. But for example, you have to you have to first of all consider what are the material areas in relation to circular economy and then disclose how you have, have made that assessment. You have to disclose what are the policies you have in place to, to address those impacts. Uh, you also have to disclose whether you have any policies in place that help you transition transition away from extraction of virgin non-renewable resources. Uh, so again, leading back to this uh, European ob objective of decoupling economic growth from resource use. Uh, if you're using bio bio based material, you also have to see like disclose around like whether you are doing anything to secure that those materials are actually uh, coming from regenerative production met methods. Uh, then you also have to re re uh, report on uh, circular economy targets, the KPIs, and the action action plans you have developed or not developed. Uh, you have to disclose what are the materials that comes into your production. So the types of material, how much uh, by weight, uh, also including packaging. Uh, then you, and I think this is one of the, the more significant ones, you also have to report on the materials that comes out of your production. So if, for example, if you're a manufacturing uh, company, you have to report on uh, the uh, by weight, how much of your your products that you put on the market are designed according to uh, to just uh, circular design principles, uh, and then finally you also have to report on anything related to waste. So how much, what type, what's the management, and so on. And then finally you also have to disclose on how any material impacts uh, regarding uh, circular economy might also be a financial risk to you as a company. Yeah. So that is quite a lot. And, and I know the CSRD and ESS is just like these big topics. I also recommend you to, to see uh, some of our other webinars where we go more in depth with, with, with these uh, policies. Uh, but at least now we focus a little bit more on like where, where does circular economy sit? And I think just like a final remark when it comes to these new reporting requirements is that companies have to understand that it's, yes, it is a really much a data challenge to finding all this information, but more importantly, you will be as a company forced to really reflect on, on how you address your impacts and how you as a company is future proof uh, going forward. Uh, so we see that a lot of companies will be starting to update their strategies and are also revisiting their business models going forward. Great, thank you so much, Maya, for the presentation. Um, that was really interesting to hear. And then next, I will be following up about specifically uh, product design and development. So under the Circular Economy Action Plan, there are actually many policies that link to the way that uh, products are designed and developed, um, many product-specific uh, regulations, for example, with circular textiles and construction products, mobile phones, batteries, and plastics. And unfortunately, we won't be getting in those in detail today, but really we'll be looking at the Sustainable Products Initiative's uh, Eco-Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, because this is really the corner cornerstone of this policy area and has so many linkages and will apply to the broadest amount of product types um, in the future. So what the proposed eco-design regulation is, is that it creates this policy framework for mandatory eco-design requirements for almost all products in the EU. And we'll get into those in a moment. 
Um, but essentially, it's just replacing what was the existing eco design directive, and that set energy efficiency requirements for um, many appliances, for example, refrigerators and others. You'll be familiar with those energy efficiency um, stickers that they have. And, but this is broadening those requ requirements to include uh, circularity principles and, and making them much more strict and, and expansive. But the eco-design regulation also contains much more. It contains a framework for developing a digital product passport that I know many of you are curious about, but uh, right now we've received very little information about exactly how that will be implemented from the EU as of yet. It'll also contain mandatory green public procurement criteria. Um, it will help support sustainable business models and work on prohibiting the destruction of unsold products. But with all this, it's important to remember that this eco-design regulation really provides the framework um, and the direction that we're going in, but rather the details of how and the specifics are further to be elaborated in delegated acts, which we just don't have yet. So these eco-design requirements that I've been talking about, um, they work to address this written out very specifically, um, integrating circularity into the early design phases of product development, and especially the, the number that's often floated around the 80% of a product's impact is determined in early design phases. So these include circular principles like durability and repairability, reusability, upgradability, reducing the presence of substances of concern, including thresholds for recycled materials. Um, and then we know the rather the, the topics that will be covered, but those specific requirements for product groups are in the process of being developed right now, as well as horizontal measures, as they're called, which will apply across different product groups uh, that have similarities. So what companies and products will be affected? Well, we know that it will not cover food, feed, and medical products. However, um, it will cover almost other all other products and will be prioritized over time and will be made to be harmonious with other product specific regulations. So right now um, it's been uh, through some preparatory work, some end use products and intermediary products have been defined. And these includes final products like hygiene products, mattresses, um, ceramic products and more, as well as the materials that go into making finalized products, which have been pre-selected as uh, the types of products and materials that have the greatest impact and this should be focused on first. And so right now, um, those products are going through a period of consultation where it's being defined exactly which ones will be on that list and um, how the requirements will be set. So what we do know is, is that eco-design regulation is going to be a real game changer whose momentum will build over time. That the fact that circularity requirements are going to be integrated into product development processes is really clear and that there will be um, strict requirements will be set. However, as I just mentioned, the process right now is still very much under development with um, public consultation going underway. The various earliest that it might, the regulation might be um, in entering into force is 2024. And at that point, those um, the product requirements will still be under development. And, and further ones be implemented over time in subsequent delegate, delegated acts. So it could be five years or more until um, many of those requirements are actually seen. However, I know that many of you are very keenly aware that product development processes do take a long time. So we definitely recommend that companies start considering and working with uh, circular and eco-design criteria as soon as possible because it takes time to change the way the companies work and, and how their processes are, are anchored. So understanding product impacts is a really good way to start to know what are likely going to be the product requirements that will affect your products. And already working with how you design and develop products and if there's ways these new requirements could be added in and considered early on design process because we know that that's coming. And then working with how you can best work with, for example, product information, uh, data lifecycle impacts and integrate that into your decision making. And of course, we know that um, the circular economy is facilitated through partnerships, and it's so important to be working with your suppliers to help improve the sustainable sourcing of materials and also to develop those partnerships so that you can secure supply chain of recycled materials, for example, and have those resilient um, supplier networks. Good. Then next, we'll move on to communication, labeling, and greenwashing. So, um, 
also connected to this policy picture in the Circular Economy Action Plan is um, these suite of uh, directive amendments and, um, and, and policy areas around empowering consumers for the green transition. So the European Commission has been is going to be requiring companies to make more sustainable products, and they really want to also be able to help reward those companies that are performing the best on sustainability by giving customers the information they need in order to actually make better informed choices, and thereby also, as Maya was saying, um, with the circular with the EU Green Deal and um, helping mobilize finance this time from consumers to help. Um, achieve those overall aims of the policy area. So, but really in order to do that right now, there are three main problems. The extent of greenwashing is, um, is very high. So in a preparatory study that was conducted, um, over half of the products examined were found to have vague, misleading and unfounded information. And I think that just shows that um, the majority of companies will have to change the way they communicate about their products and so this is going to require a shift in the norms of how products are communicated. There is also um, a lack of standard methodology to support claims, which was founded by the EU, which makes them um, have got, undergone a process to develop their own uh, process with the product environmental footprints. And currently um, in the preparatory work, it was also found there was an assessment of 232 active eco-labels in the EU. And it was concluded that um, almost half of them were either had verification that was too weak or not carried out. So the EU wants to reduce the amount of eco labels and only keep the most rigorous ones. So then I'll now explain to you a bit more about the policy areas that are working to address these problems. So first we have two um, amendments to existing consumer rights directives that are going to help provide customers, giving them a right to in, um, information about durability and repairability. And um, now customers have right to information on, uh, for example, guaranteed durability of products. Um, and they will also have um, the, the right to having transparency on the availability of repair, um, spare parts, repair manuals, software updates, and then for product types where it's relevant, uh, repairability score. There's also the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive that outlines practices that companies cannot uh, engage in. They're considered to be misleading. That has then been expanded to also include environmental and social impacts and durability and repairability. So I'll go into those in a moment. But this essentially applies to any company marketing products in the EU. Um, and these have already been proposed um, as of last year. And once they are adopted, it'll take about two years to be implemented by member states and countries in the EU who will be responsible for regulating. So under the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, we have uh, 12 commercial practices that are considered to be misleading and um, 10 that are unfair in all circumstances. But rather than read them all out to you, I'll summarize that essentially communication has to be precise, substantiated, so that companies must have uh, commitments and targets to back up their claims and validated with independent monitoring. And companies cannot be generic and vague about sustainability, for example, saying that something's just eco-friendly, making claims about the entire product when it only concerns a certain aspect, displaying labels such as the one pictured here that are not based on third-party verification, or also omitting information about durability, repairability, or lifespan and intentional features to limit lifespan are just simply not allowed. So this includes, um, situations where phones might have uh, software updates that limit the lifespan, or for example, printer cartridges that are limiting the lifespan of printers by um, saying that they're due to replacement when they may not actually physically need that. So these are some examples of practices that um, will not no longer be allowed. And then finally, we have the Directive on Green Claims, which is really articulating um, how sustainability performance must be substantiated. So it's putting the onus on companies that if you voluntarily want to communicate the sustainability um, of your product and claim that it's, it's sustainable, these are the criteria that you must follow. Um, and these are the methodologies that you must use to back up your claims so that consumers actually have access to reliable, comparable, and verifiable information. 
And this is just for companies who want to make uh, green claims about their products and their sustainability. So it's not necessarily required, but it's outlining the EU has been working uh, for a number of years to develop methodologies um, called the product environmental footprints and the organizational environmental footprints that are um, LCA life assessments method methods based on existing standards, including um, ISO 14,040 and 44, which are standard LCA methodologies, but rather creating more standardization um, while still allowing for flexibility that's needed. And then they'll further develop rules for each product category so that there's a benchmark that can actually allow for comparison between product footprints and help give consumers that information. So we're very much looking forward to actually the draft of the Directive on Green Claims. It's supposed to be um, released any day now by the end of March, 2023, although it's a leak that's currently available. Um, and then once it is adopted, it'll be around the same time that it'll be trans uh, transposed along with the previous regulations, um, but at least uh, two or three years from now, probably. And then that's all for that section of the day. And now we'll go into some key takeaways and I'll give that the word over to you, Maya, again. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, yes, so we had, had like a very speedy run through of some of the most important policy changes that is coming your way as companies. And I hope that kind of the key messages we wanted to get across is that, yes, this is a lot of complexity. Uh, companies will have, you will have to report on a number of areas and really reflect on, on how these are things are interrelated. You will have to understand design and, and eco design at a new level. Uh, but it's but these uh, kind of complex uh, challenges that are coming your way, they are inevitable. It is something that is being regulated and will be required. Um, so secondly, I mean, I think right now when we talk to companies, there's a big focus on like how to get the data yeah, it's just to be, it's to follow the law and get the right data system in place and so on. Uh, but also, as I as we talked about before, this is also very much an opportunity. So if you can get ahead of these uh, changes and be proactive, uh, for example, when it comes to reporting, now you have a long checklist of areas that you know you need to perform on in terms of sustainability. So start learning about what is what is considered uh, best practice in these areas start having because this is an opportunity to also position yourself better towards for example your customers or investors and i think also as, as michelle mentioned it's also with with the new design requirements yes they might be out further out in the future but um but it's also and this is of course also linked to the last message is that if you apply a very reactive approach you risk uh uh, investing in, for example, development of products that won't comply in the future. So this is very much about thinking about what are the future demands and expectations and trying to start uh, shape your shape yourself so you fit those um, and get gain those competitive advantages that would give you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, and thank you for rounding us off. And then now...